thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I was asked to give a presentation about compost and soil microbiology alive on screen. And at first we were thinking about actually showing them uh, live, but then I opted for the safer version and I, I brought for you some videos that I captured over the past years. So, as it was mentioned, uh, I do consulting through a little business, uh, Terra Vitka, where I work with farmers uh, across the country. And also, um, I'm a member of an NGO uh, for regenerative agriculture, which is a, a, a very exciting uh, group of farmers who are uh, making soil healthier in Hungary. And in, the, in addition to this, uh, I'm pursuing my PhD at the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences. And I'm lucky to have uh, Professor Borbala Biro as my advisor, with whom we research uh, compost-based microbial inoculants and their effect on seeds and the interaction of soil-plant microbiome. Okay, so uh, before I get into the microbes that probably you are excited to see, I want to give a little bit of background uh, from the point of the soil food web. Uh, and let's go to the start. And probably in my presentation, there is nothing new for you, especially most of the stuff that I'm sharing with you, you already heard in the past couple of hours. Um, but let's have a nice summary of what we actually have heard here. So first of all, I must state that it's the plants who run the show, and you will understand soon why it is so. And another beautiful thing that I want to share with you is that you probably have noticed that a miracle is happening around us every single day when the sun comes up the horizon. And that is what fuels us all. And light energy and CO2 is actually making life and plants happen. And this is the building block of life. So if you say that we are all made out of thin air for the most part, that's what plants make happen. So the miracle of photosynthesis is feeding us. And the old paradigm was that actually uh, plant material, decomposing plant material is, um, I'm looking for the laser pointer, sorry. So decomposing plant material and plant roots are feeding soil with carbon. And there is a new story in science uh, a recent discovery that plants exude, as root exudates, large part of this photosynthetic material uh, to the root system, to the rhizosphere, which is an area around plant roots. And these root exudates are carbon-containing car, uh, carbon materials. There are simpler uh, substances, like sugars and amino acids, and also there are much more complex substance, substances like um, uh, enzymes and hormones. And these all are there to regulate bacterial populations around the root system. So more simple sugars and other carbohydrates uh, create, uh, help to increase bacterial biomass and more complex compounds are there to regulate the community structure of this microbial biomass. So this is why I said that it's the plants who run the show because the plants are able to direct their, um, the substances that they exude in order to have the right bacterial population for they need to be met. For example, this is suppression, nutrient cycling, and the list is long. How does, for example, nutrient cycling happen? I got this beautiful drawing from Kathleen Solbach's website, 
and she makes these amazing drawings of um, uh, micro, uh, soil microbiology. So here, uh, you see a root, you see a bunch of uh, bacteria on the picture, but you also see larger creatures. And um, for example, protozoa, amoebas, ciliates, and a nematode. And when they eat a bacteria, so the plant is attracting the bacteria, and when they eat a bacteria, what they excrete is what the plant is able to take up. So this is why we need to have the soil food web in our soil system, because that's what enhances nutrient cycling. So here is a, a really nice drawing of the soil food web. Uh, the first trophic level are the photosynthesizers. As I mentioned, plants, but also um, photosynthetic microbes, for example, algae. And then in the second trophic level, we have those who consume some sort of plant material or also the uh, uh, decomposing matter of uh, other creatures. Here is bacteria, which is able to consume dead and live organic matter, but also is able to uh, have a symbiosis with plants, just like fungi. And there is also the not so much liked uh, uh, plant parasitic nematodes. And then in the second trophic level, we have those higher organisms who are able to eat the first trophic level organisms, just like Alfred's earthworms, nematodes, beneficial nematodes, and also the single celled protozoa and arthropods. And as we go on in this soil food web, we get to the largest creatures, mammals and birds and so on, and of course us, because we need not to forget that we are part of this system. Okay, so now, now that we know all these, let's look at some microscopy images. These images are going to come mostly from compost samples, and the simple reason for that is that if you look at these two images, on the left side and on the right side, you also see nemat uh, a nematode. But the images from soils contain a lot of mineral uh, particles, which makes their visibility much uh, more reduced. So I opted for compost samples for the most part because the creatures are just much more visible. Uh, and there is a huge overlap between soil and compost creatures, so you will not miss much. This is a direct microscopy method that I have been used in the past that I learned uh, mostly from Elaine Ingham. And this is a very simple tool that a farmer can also learn to assess their soil. A simple, beautiful tool to actually see these creatures in our own soil and compost samples. So here is the first video that I'm showing to you. Here we see a fungal hyphae. This is a pretty nice fungal hyphae with a medium diameter, not completely uh, transparent, probably a saprophytic fungi. And we also see on the right side and also on the left side some decomposing organic matter, partially humified. Probably there is gazillions of bacteria in these aggregates. And these, this dark brown color is um, the color of uh, humified organic matter, humic acids. OK, I start the video. And for the most part, what you will see here is the bacteria bouncing around. And here you see a rod-shaped bacteria. And also uh, you see a bunch of cocci. These are the bacilli, the rod-shaped bacteria, and the cocci are the most um, uh, prevalent uh, forms of bacteria in the soil. Of course, there is so many different species that it's uh, hard to know, and very few of them we actually know maybe one to five percent, although genetics give us a broader picture of this. Um, in the second trophic level, as I mentioned, there is amoebae. Here we see in the middle of the picture a testate amoebae. 
most soil and compost amoebas have this silica shell that is uh, some sort of a protection for them. And um, when I start the video, you will see that there is a bunch of things moving around inside this amoeba. So probably some bacteria is actually eating this uh, amoeba right here. Maybe there is a flagellate even inside there because there is a, uh, this wiggly motion there. I'm showing you a few more pictures of amoeba. Uh, here you see another testate amoeba. Uh, and if you Google uh, amoebae and look at some uh, scanning electron micrographs of them, their diversity and the structure of their shells is just uh, mind-boggling. It's so beautiful. Here is an Archiella, actually, too. This is also a kind of testate amoebae. And then here is a naked amoebae. And um, I haven't brought you a video of them because it takes forever until they actually make a significant move. And uh, you also see a beautiful fungal spore here. And uh, you might have seen some of them throughout uh, the previous images too. Here is another amoebae. Um, and here again, from the second trophic level, we see a nematode. And we already talked about um, uh, parasitic nematodes, but it's very important to acknowledge their importance because there is not only plant feeding nematodes, but there is also bacterial feeding nematodes who are a very important part of nutrient cycling. So the way you can notice whether uh, what that particular nematode likes to eat is for the most part from their mouth part. So here there is this parallel little kennel where actually a bacteria can rightly fit in. There are also other diagnostic features of uh, uh, nematodes that helps you identify them. There is also a big bacterial diversity here. There is rod-shaped and coxy-shaped bacteria and who is this guy on the right side, um, it is a mite, probably, unfortunately, a dead mite. So it's not going after this nematode. Uh, okay, again, another protozoa. This is a ciliate. And ciliates are indicative of um, a high moisture content. So when we have a very moist compost or we have a waterlogged soil, they are much more likely to show up. Uh, they also consume bacteria and important part of uh, nutrient uh, immobilization and then also nutrient excretion and making them available for plants. A rotifer. Um, rotifers also mostly eat anything that actually fits their mouth. They have this coronal cilia that creates a current and sweeps food into their digestive system. And when you see rotifers in your sample, again, just like ciliates, they like to live in water. So it's mostly a, a little bit too moist compost and, and uh, a soil that is having too much moisture. Fungi. This is a beautiful fungal hyphae. Uh, according to the school where I'm coming from, we like to see colored fungal hyphae, which is a pretty wide diameter. We usually compare the fungal diameter to the bacteria around. So this bacteria and this bacteria, these black little dots are about a micrometer uh, diameter. So when compare it to this fungal hyphae, maybe this is eight micrometers, which is pretty thick. And probably this is a saprophytic fungi. And we really like to see them both in compost and soils. And they are very sensitive to management, very sensitive to term, turning of compost, and also very sensitive to, for example, tillage in a soil system. So we need to protect them because they are a very important part of uh 
spreading nutrients around and also uh, spreading information around the soil system. Uh, and here is this in this beautiful video, which is a hundred times magnification, we see an organic aggregate, a decomposing organic blob, maybe, with uh, a bunch of fungal hyphae growing out of it. And a whole lot of fungal feeding nematodes are having a feast here. The way you can recognize a fungal feeding nematode is again their mouth part. They have a sphere which they can use to puncture a fungal hyphae and then suck out its contents. And unfortunately, I haven't included an image from a predatory nematode which is able to keep other nematodes and other creatures in check. Some larger creatures before I finish. Here we see a columbola, in other words, a springtail, which like to eat fungi. Um, they are less, most of the time, they are uh, about a millimeter plus minus a little bit uh, big, and they are able to jump even half a meter. And uh, when you have a fungal dominated compost, you are likely to see a lot of springtails in it. Here is a tiny little mite. They can be shredders, they can eat organic debris, bacteria, and so on. And they make this whole system work. So, and for closing, um, I want to ask the question how can we enhance soil biology? And um, the reason. Uh, we need to do this is clear for nutrient cycling, for disease suppression, uh, for improvement of water holding capacity, and so on. And there is many steps we can do, and many of them are part of these eco schemes that were mentioned by Antanas and also Sarah. Um, and um, yeah, so. One of the most important things, and this ties back to where I began, they need a habitat. These microbes need to have living roots all year round because it's the plants who run the show. It's the plant rhizosphere where most of these creatures live. We need to avoid tillage, and I know that it's pretty hard in organic agriculture, but we gradually need to move towards that use green manures and cover crops that was widely discussed uh, in some of the presentations here so i'm not going to add to this anything else we need to apply uh, organic matter and it's very important to compost manure composted uh, manure has a much larger diversity of these creatures, a much more mature uh, community structure that is also that helps to improve soil health. And um, we can also use compost based microbial inoculants. We can apply them. Uh, there is uh, many different kinds, like for example, Alfred Grant has been researching compost teas. I mainly work with compost extracts, good quality compost applied on the seed as a coating or at planting in the furrow. Uh, we can also apply them as foliar sprays. There is many ways where we can introduce uh, a mature, good compost microbial population to our growing system. So uh, this is all I wanted to share with you today. And I invite you all to work together to bring soils back to life. And uh, I'm very happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Vitalia, for the really inspiring talk and the close-up look uh, of the soil and its inhabitants. Thank you very much. And regarding the close-up look, uh, there is one one a question where many participants are interested in what zoom rate should the microscope have to see something interesting in the soil itself mm. i'm sorry can you repeat the yes, question sure. um, the question was what zoom rate should the microscope have to see something interesting in the soil what can you rec can you recommend a microscope oh yes yeah. oh. what zoom rate what zoom rate? Oh, what zoom? Okay, yes. sorry, uh, <laughs> I didn't get here. Um, yeah, so these images, most of these images were taken at 400 times magnification. Um, some of the creatures, like for example, nematodes can be already noticed at 10 times or four times magnification you gradually you develop an eye for i mean not 10 times i'm sorry uh 40 times magnification you can already notice nematodes and uh at 100 times you are able to notice uh amoebae and fungal hyphae um but these most of these images were taken at 400 times magnification mm -hmm. Thank you. And the other question you already mentioned that was um, what kind of microscope you can uh, mm -hmm. recommend to to start looking at the soil and furthermore, how did you take the videos and was it with the, did you, by the help of mm -hmm. the external camera or it's, it's yeah. a function of the microscope? Um, I don't oh. know if you can see it in the background, yes. maybe. Uh, that is a really, really simple um, maybe in the us they call it student microscope it's a biological microscope um quite simple uh mine is uh, uh the brand is called omax but in europe for example in netherlands you can get uh, euromax it's called a good brand um they have a um a sub brand which is called b scope on um, there is also eye scope those are very very good microscopes you want to make sure that it has an abbey conden um, condenser and iris diaphragm and uh is capable of doing uh from 40 to 400 times magnification and the videos were taken by an old smartphone oh, yeah. i I do have a camera for the microscope, but it's not taking as good images as this one. And uh, I just basically hold it for the most part at the eyepiece. And uh, sometimes I manage to fix it onto a lens. Uh, yeah, I'm just like juggling around with options here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. And I wanted to ask you, can you please uh, stop sharing the screen? I mean, I love the share, but then we, the benefit oh. would be we would see, uh, yes, the microscope better. Here I you don't go. See it, yeah. uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I haven't noticed that I'm still sharing my screen. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem, no problem. Um, another question is, uh, what do you think of microbiome en engineering, adding organisms to the soil, e.g. to enhance the plant growth? <laughs> yeah, it's... Um... On it, to be honest, uh, I do have an opinion, but I don't know enough to really make a very educated statement about it. Um, to me, what is very, very uh, almost like funny or ironic in this story is that um, we always try to engineer stuff and uh, create the perfect microbe even if we need you know some genetic tweaking there and we think that we are going to create something that is better what nature can provide and really uh come if we just do a simple composting we can we are able to breed an, an amazing array of beneficial microorganisms and diversity we have been talking about diversity so much here i I firmly believe that we are not going to be able to find the perfect single microbe that is going to save our all our problems. So we can play around <laughs> if we want with all kinds of like engineering, tweaking, playing. 
fine, but at the end of the day, those um, uh, um, soil health um, practices are going to able to do what we are actually want to achieve at the end of the day. And all those things that you all already mentioned, using green manures, just first creating the habitat for these guys until we don't have the habitat, no matter how many engineered stuff you apply, it's not going to save anything and do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question, um, what's your opinion on inoculating bacteria strains and or trichoderma SPP into the soil or on the seed to improve microbial activity in the root resistance? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to know the, the answer to this question. Uh, this is my research topic now. This is what I'm mainly focusing on. And for now, I can mostly tell you my hopes <laughs> that I really, really hope that we are able to enhance the interaction between plant soil microbiome by directly putting microorganisms onto the seed. I personally don't believe in single strains. I know that trichoderma, for example, uh, works. There is many studies that show that trichoderma can benefit if you use that. There is also many different kinds of mycorrhizal inoculants that are able to help. But if we would like to have a general improvement, then compost-based microbial inoculants are the way to go in my opinion, but I still need to find really solid proof for that. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, answer the question? Yes, I yes, I would say so, yes. Um, another question is by Paul. Um, he's asking how much damage a good imported compost could do to native soil, let's say from South Europe to North, he's asking. How much, let me see, how much damage mm -hmm. or good imported compost could do to native soil? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Uh, what I, I tend to believe is that uh, again, the habitat is what is important and whatever is uh, able to survive in that soil are going to join that system. And um, I'm not quite sure what an imported compost would have that is different from, from what we have here. So I can't really give you a good and educated answer about this. but. One thing is that why would you import compost from other places when you can create your own in your microenvironment, at least uh, in terms of compost as an inoculant? In large scale, of course, it's a different story, but you will not import large scale or big quantities of compost from Asia or anywhere else anyways. And for uh, you can actually inoculate um, 100 hectares from two or three cubic meters of good quality compost if you use it as a liquid amendment. So um, why would you import it, really? Mm. Um, yes, um, another question is, what do you uh, think of bioproducts you can buy at the market? That was one um, question. Mm -hmm. I wonder if... Um, the question relates to uh, bacterial mm. inoculants or, um, but in general, if mm. that's what the question actually points to, my opinion about them is quite similar to uh, what I think about engineered mm. stuff. Again, when we buy a can of um, a bacterial product that contain one, two, maybe six, eight strains of, of bacteria. And um, those are from um, those very few um, strains that we are actually able to uh, cultivate in a lab. And these are all um, produced in industrial systems. So one of my questions, and actually I haven't seen data about that, are they able to survive? 
I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if the benefit actually comes from the bacteria itself that is in the can that you buy, or it comes from uh, the carrier materials, because usually these contain some sort of humic acids and etc. that is also in the bucket that you buy. So I'm not really sure. Um, again, compost is so much cheaper, really, and mm -hmm. diversity. Go for diversity. Oh, yes, yes. Um, we have two last questions, maybe. Uh, the first one is, what is your knowledge um, um, what, uh, regarding the lifespan of microbes in uh, compost tea? And uh, the use of the compost tea, does it have a positive effect to prevent diseases in crops? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the lifespan. So each microorganism has its lifespan from birth to death or until it's eaten. For a bacteria, it's about, on average, 20 minutes. And then uh, uh, larger creatures have longer lifespans. Uh, nematode, uh, an R strategist, nematode, a bacterial feeding R strategist, can live for two weeks. A uh, predatorial nematode can live for two years. But I kind of believe that actually your question is like how long the diversity persists in compost. And generally, what it, from from my experience, um, depending on your composting method, a, a thermocompost can reach its uh, peak in diversity and biomass at around six months. Uh, a Johnson and Sue compost can reach it at around one year, and then the bacterial biomass and diversity maintains for a period of time, which is about two, two and a half years in my experience. And then gradually, of course, there is less and less bacteria over time and larger, uh, higher level creatures take over the space. There is more fungi, there is more uh, case strategist, um, uh, larger level creatures like nematodes and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other question was... Oh, uh, now we have to, uh, to close the, the question <laughs> on the right side because we are already uh, over the time limit. But okay. actually, I wanted to ask you maybe, I mean, you can either uh, answer like a question like ahead or you can give us or you can combine it. Uh, uh, option number three, like that you give us um, two key uh, take home messages for the audience take-home messages, uh, follow the soil health principles and create habitat for microorganisms that are going to support your plants and your crops at the end of the day. That was so quick. I mean, if you want to, you can still <laughs> answer one question. <laughs> we got time. <laughs> I mean, if you want. Yeah, I haven't one, one answered question. the previous question's second part and uh, yeah. Honestly, uh, and I'm really sorry, but I forgot what the uh, your uh, compost tea, right? Yes, yes, they have yes. a positive effect to present mm -hmm. disease of mm -hmm. crops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is an incredible amount of literature uh, today, uh, scientific in the scientific literature about the effect of compost tea on disease suppression. And there are very good results. I don't know if anybody really reports the bad results, mm -hmm. but a lot of good results are reported for common plant diseases, how actually a compost-based products, which can be compost tea, compost extract, non-aerated or aerated compost teas, most of them have beneficial effect most of them have disease suppression qualities and i i did i'm doing that right now seed tests where i uh, inoculate seeds in petri dishes and i had a control where i used only water and i had different uh compost extracts in different dilution and what I noticed, and that's not the focus of my studies, but this is something that I actually noticed, is that in three days, uh, one of the um, little experiments were three days. And in three days, 
the treatment that had only water got mold in it. It smelled of mold, it got mold in it. But the ones that had compost uh, extracts in them, there was no mold at all. You could just smell this beautiful earthy smell. So that's my little experience. But if you look at the literature, you find plenty. Okay. Okay. Super. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much you. for that little talk and answering all the questions. Thank you so much. <laughs>